a discipleship today also so welcome to any new uh, almost disciples here this reading secrets of worship is from rays of the same light by Swami Kriyananda this passage from the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita is excerpted from the ninth chapter the 25th stanza the Gita says those who worship lesser gods go to their gods, but those who worship me come to me. This stanza in its complete form contrasts various levels of experience in an after-death state in the astral world with the state of final union with God. The great truth expressed by this stanza, however, can be applied equally well to the contrast between divine union and the attainment of worldly goals. For the average person, material ends are his gods. His, he worships them with a devotion that would win great spiritual rewards were his efforts only directed toward divine attainment. Worship might be defined thus, to be absorbed in the contemplation of some great good, whether real or imaginary. Worship is not the mere performance of outward religious rites. It is a matter of inner attitude. Rituals are meaningless without devotion. A man might go to church regularly, but if inwardly he is absorbed in dreaming of some profitable business venture, then in fact what he is worshiping is money. Hence the commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The direction of a person's desires determines the directions of his life will take two and indicates what he will eventually become. Those who worship lesser gods go to their gods. Absorption in the thought of any goal whatsoever in the conviction that it is a great good draws a person to that sphere of existence. One comes to reflect its realities, however illusory, in his consciousness and he attracts those people, situations, and opportunities which will reinforce his convictions. If a person lives only to revenge himself on his enemies, his obsession for revenge will remain with him long after he has, as he thinks, even things out with them. Others will be attracted to him who harbor similar desires for revenge, thus reinforcing one another in their bitterness. They may all come in time to look upon vengeance as almost a sacred principle. For a person who wants to become a great artist, he who absorbs himself in the worship of art as a great good, art becomes his god. He will accordingly go to that god as his life becomes progressively centered in art alone. The friends he attracts will be artists. In time, he may find it difficult even to imagine, except possibly in caricature, any other sphere of activity. It is interesting to see how quickly newcomers to a city manage to encounter their own kind. Within hours, thieves manage to meet other thieves, drunkards to find drunkards, businessmen are soon mixing with other businessmen, artists with fellow artists and devotees very soon meet others who love God. Long-term residents may be unaware of how many types of humanity jostle their way through their city's streets. 
Does the need to absorb oneself in whatever one does, if one would become good at it, mean that one will go to that God instead of to the Supreme Lord? It is ne- uh, is it necessary, in other words, for the devotee to avoid being good at anything so as not to divert his devotion away from God? This is an example of the kind of confusion into which people can stray when they remove spiritual teaching from the practical experience of their own life. The fact is, to become good at anything is a help, not a hindrance. In anything else one attempts to accomplish, God communion is not their last chance at glory for the failures of this world. The important thing is not to worship whatever one does in life, that is, not to look upon it as a supreme good. One should view it instead as simply something that requires doing. The best work in any case is that which is done in a consciousness of inner freedom and in the thought of God and for the glory of God, offering, as the Gita teaches, the fruits of one's actions to the Lord. Such a person not only finds God, but while seeking him, discovers that success in any other field comes to him as well. Hence the the importance of bhav, the attitude the devotee holds in his relationship with the Lord. Those who worship me come to me. To worship God means to approach him with an attitude of love, of dedication, and self-offering of total absorption in the contemplation of him in deep inner communion. Those whose lives thus revolve around their desire for God will will surely come to him. Such is the Lord's promise. Thus, through the Bhagavad Gita, God has spoken to mankind. From Whispers from Eternity by Paramhansa Yogananda. This is entitled, Make Me a Lion of Thy All-Conquering Wisdom. I, a lion cub of the Divine Mother, found myself thrown into life among the sheep of human frailties, of fear, failure, and disease. Living long among them, I learned to bleat with weakness, forgetting my lion nature and its roars, which could frighten away any petty pestering sorrows. O lion of realization, thou didst drag me away from those bleating sheep to the mirror-smooth waters of meditation. There didst thou cry, Gaze! But I held my eyes tightly shut, bleating with fear. Thy roar of wisdom then reverberated through my body, Thou madest me, by hard shaking and spiritual urging, open my eyes. And there, lo, in the crystal pool of my inner peace, I saw my features to be even as thine own. Now I know myself as the lion of cosmic power. I will bleat no more with fear, weakness, and suffering, for I roar now with vibrant, almighty power. I bound about through the forest of all experiences, seizing little creatures of vexing worries, timid fears, and wild hyenas of disbelief, devouring them ruthlessly. O lion of immortality, roar through me thine all-conquering power of wisdom. It's lovely to hear Krishna's words from the Gita before this and to see how much they, uh, how much teaching there is in them. That those who worship lesser gods go to their gods and those who worship me go to me, come to me. And obviously it's not meant in a um, uh, sort of comparing one religion to another because Krishna is the God of all gods. You know, God is the God of all gods. He was speaking with that God consciousness. And so once we very, you know, conveniently clear that out of the way, then we see that there are so many other gods that uh, people worship and end up. I'm going to go get the candles. Yeah, okay. There are so many other gods that people worship 
and end up going there. And why should they go there? Because as we think, so we become. We become what we concentrate on. It's a very powerful teaching for the devotee. We can always apply these things to, you know, when we were not on the spiritual path and then once we've become on the spiritual path, that, oh, yes, 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 when I was interested in those things, then that's all I found, and now I'm interested in God, and so on. And the, there's, first of all, it's good to celebrate that we're on the path. It's good to say, yes, yes, this is what I want. <clears throat> but at the same time, we don't want to just rest there. You see, it's sort of like, I want to take the airplane route to God. That's what Master said Kriya Yoga is. And so then I have got my ticket, I have boarded the plane, and it hasn't taken off, but I'm sitting and enjoying the fact that I'm on the plane, because I am on the plane. But the purpose of the plane is to fly. And even more than to fly, it is to deliver us to the destination. Have you ever been on a plane that was trying to land? And they, I mean, this is serious. So you're just like, wow, wouldn't it? No, I mean it. If you've been on a plane that, you know, is trying to come into the airport, but because of congestion or air traffic, you end up just going in circles around the airport. And so you know that certain feeling even before the pilot says anything, because you hear the engines are alternately running and roaring, and you think, we've been descending for a long time. If we continue to descend, I think we would enter the earth and go beyond. Like, why is it taking so long? And then the pilot finally says, yeah, so um, as you probably noticed, we are just circling. And so we don't want to be content to just circle. The metaphor breaks down because, of course, God we can think of as above us. We're not trying to land on God. But anyway, you get the idea that just to go around in circles, see, I'm in a plane. I'm on the spiritual path. I know what the right direction is, is not enough. One of the dangers on the spiritual path is that of complacency, which is to say, complacency, you could say, is the negative side of contentment. Contentment is good. It's actually... Um, uh, santosha, it's one of the niyamas, so it's, it's said by the saints to be the supreme virtue. So that's the, obviously the positive side of contentment, but the negative, the temptation of contentment to, is to say, I'm good enough as I am. See how much better I am than I used to be. See how much better I am than <coughs> that guy over there. And so instead, we can just be happy with what we've achieved so far and just rest there. It's an obvious temptation because the spiritual path takes work. And so there's the, again, temptation to just, oh, I think I've done enough for now, see how far I've come, isn't that good? <coughs> now, isn't it good enough? Now, of course, we do want to uh, have sort of a push, not a push and pull, but a, a rhythm. You can't always be full on. You have to know when to take a moment and regroup and to rest and to have fun and to smile. Again, as you've often heard me say, just check the uh, attunement device, which is that piece of glass hanging in your bathroom, the mirror. Just look at it. You don't even have to say mirror, mirror on the wall and it says yara. You just look at it <coughs> and you say yara. And if you see yourself, Maybe it's a problem, but if you see master, then it's good. If you see a light in the eyes, if you see sparkle, if you see teeth at all, and they're with a circle, not kind of hard, this kind of teeth, <laughs> then you know, okay, I'm doing okay. But if that smile fades, that's a warning. There's a problem. And so we might need to relax. But on the other hand, why relax for too long? Just think of that plane circling. You see, so rather than worry about other people, let us worry about ourselves. And not even worry, but let's take responsibility. We are the only one we are responsible for on this earth. This is the, Swamiji writes this in the New Path. The only job set squarely on our shoulders by God is to know ourselves, which is to say to know Him, to know God. Everybody has that same job. You know, you can say to some person, what work do you have? Oh, I'm an accountant. What work do you have? Oh, I'm a policeman. Oh, what work do you have? And so on. Well, I don't have any work. No, we all, we all have the work, 
of finding God. So it's sort of like, what, do you, what are you doing today? I'm doing Excel. No, you're trying to find God. And so what else are you doing? Same, same only. And so we're all again in the same boat. Now some of us seek God in different ways. Some of us say, well, first of all, I, would, I want money. As Dharmini was reading in, the, in, the, in Swamiji's, from Swamiji's book. And of course, on one level, it makes sense. I mean, we can always say, oh, money, vain dam, vain dam, and so on, and it's not spiritual. But look, it, people see that if I have more of money, I can accomplish more in life. And that addresses the, the sort of primal urge of the third chakra. The more money I have, the more safe I am in case of unexpected things. And if you've never been... Uh, completely without money in a very bad situation, it's important to acknowledge that uh, that's a real thing. I, I met somebody who had really had a hard time of it. In other words, she had this wonderful life and then one day it all just fell apart and she didn't know where she was going to live, how she was going to eat, and so on. And friends took care of her, helped her along. She never actually hit rock bottom, but she was this close. And I understood that at other times when there were trivial matters that were not life-threatening, but she was a little nervous around them, that she had been through a hard experience that I hadn't been through. And I had no right to say, oh, come on, don't worry, it's fine. Look, everything's fine. That leaves an impression. Some of us have that impression not having gone through it in this lifetime. As Haridas likes to joke, we all remember our past lives in debtor's prison. And so sometimes you can have a little setback and go, <gasps> you know, and think it's some big deal, and it isn't. You see some wealthy people have, they still feel that they have nothing because they remember having nothing, and they haven't tuned in to the current, you know, what's happening on the channel right now. And so this idea of wealth for my own safety, my own uh, ability to expand my dominion, my power, but again, to expand. You see, that's all we're trying to do on the spiritual path is expand our consciousness, expand our connection, not only with God, but even with God and others. So it's the same drive. It's just not quite the highest attitude. Doesn't the word attitude in planes mean the angle of the plane? Yeah, isn't that wonderful? See, attitude, that's where the word comes from, or at least where it's used, is the plane's angle. The inclination, is it going up or is it going down? When you think plane and attitude, you might think altitude. Like, no, no, that's, that's the thing. That's how high you are. But you see, much more, than how, much more important than how high you are or low you are is the direction in which you are pointing because that is where you're going to end up. So don't worry about any of these other things. Just say, am I aimed up or down? Because you can be way up high, but if you're aimed down, eventually, if you don't take care of things, it's going to be a problem. And if you think, no, 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 I'm nowhere compared to all these mahants and so on, just say, listen, I'm going in the right direction. This is perhaps even where the word attitude comes from. As we envision what we focus on, what we uh, draw to ourselves, is, comes from our own attitude. This is even true in the brain. I don't mean the brain causes this, but the brain reflects this truth. Which is to say that as you think in certain ways, as you try to develop a new habit, for example, of meditation, the brain starts to rewire itself. It physically changes how the neurons connect and so on. It's basically optimizing the uh, the sort of thought patterns, you could say, or the roadways inside of itself. So as you are always trying to uh, develop some new skill, the brain says, oh, is this what we're doing now? And so it tries to shorten the distance or do other kinds of optimization now that you're using it in a new way. And they say that it takes about six months for this thing to be fully sort of established and so on. But in any case, it is it is proving, or it is demonstrating, I should say, this truth, which is that what we concentrate on, it's like we're broadcasting energy. We're generating magnetism. And that's not only where we go, but as Swamiji says in the reading, it's also what we attract. And so all we have to work on is our attitude. And so it can then become a question though, those who worship you know, me come to me, so how shall we worship God? 
one simple thing is anything that you like and you sort of say, yes, God, I like you, but I also like this and can maybe I go to this and then you, uh, is to just see what it is you like about that thing and then try to see God in it. You know, Swamiji would make the comment sometimes that uh, often popular music expresses beautiful sentiments, me sentiments, meaning music that's popular at the time, not always. But he recalled some of the love songs of, that were popular on the radio in the 1940s, and he said they're basically all saying the same thing as every love song has said since, you know, 6000 BC and so on. But if you apply those feelings to God, then it's very sweet. He said there were words, um, we've played a game of hide and seek, of stay away, but it's, it's cost me more, far more than I can pay. I surrender, dear. And he said that was just a, a song about human love, but if you think of it about applied to God, it's beautiful. And so, again, look for God in those things that attract you. And this is also, Krishna says in the Gita, you know, uh, in the wise I am their wisdom, you know, or of, the, of, the, of light I am the sun, and all those different superlatives of God's ultimate manifestation that way. So see that in what attracts you, rather than saying, no, it doesn't attract me, I only choose God. But in one eye, as Master said, inclines <laughs> over to that. No, just it's okay. Don't, as Swamiji said to someone, the man was saying, I do want God, but I also want designer clothes and a nice car and all the fancy treasures. And uh, Swamiji said, it's fine to want those. And he said, oh, yeah, it is. He said, yeah. He said, it may take you a little longer to get to God. And the guy said, wait, 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 wait. You say it's fine, but it'll take me longer. And Swamiji said, but why pretend you don't have those desires when you do? You see, very understanding, very accepting. Sure, it, as Master said, when we do wrong, we should never say it wasn't wrong. We should say it was wrong, but so what? Learn from it, grow from it, try to make amends if you can, if it involves another person. But otherwise, we're doing all kinds of wrong things. That's, why we're, that's how we discover that they're wrong. There's a joke running around, you know, these days of, I think it's a recycled joke from many years ago, but that's what happens when enough of us forgot the joke, it comes up again, that uh, some young man says to an older man, how have you become so successful? And the, young man, the older man says, good judgment. And the young man says, how do you develop good judgment? And the old man says, bad judgment. <laughs> and so we make mistakes and we learn. Our goal really is to learn. That's also the attitude. It doesn't matter where we are on the spectrum, but if we're learning, then our attitude, our angle is up. We are inclined in the right direction. The one thing I would say too, though, is if you, for example, you have a tendency towards self-criticism, which I find very common on the spiritual path among yogis. It's funny. Uh, in America, people will sometimes have this attitude of self-criticism and they'll say, oh, well, it's because, you see, of my Judeo-Christian background, because there's a lot in the religion that talks about how you should not think that you're any good. In fact, that's not what the religion says, but that's how it's interpreted. And so um, I was trying to explain that, no, no, but people in India it sometimes will feel the same way and say, well, that's because they remember their past lives when they had a Judeo-Christian background. <laughs> and so, but, <laughs> but it's not. It's because you can always take, and this is the, any religion, and see, this is how it makes me small. This is how it makes me wrong. This is how it makes me bad. Why? As Master said, that is man's own doing. It is man's own interpretation. It is not what Krishna is saying. And don't let anyone convince you otherwise. On the one hand, yes, we are nothing. And on the other hand, we are everything because we are God. We're not special in ourselves as separate <coughs> from God, but we are very special and dearly loved by God as a part of Him as Divine Mother's own child. As Swamiji said once, you can say to Divine Mother, look, you know, naughty or good, I'm your child. That's what Master said. And Swamiji added, you know, you're stuck with me anyway. If you don't like it, you shouldn't have created me in the first place. This is what you get. This is who I am. Let's go forward together. So don't take in other people's critical energy. If we do, 
If someone is critical of us and we take it in, it's because there's some part of us that believes it, that accepts it, that resonates. If somebody comes up to you and says, you have green hair and I hate it, you sort of, I didn't have green hair this morning. And you kind of check the mirror and go, no green hair. No, I can't stand your green hair. You say, well, that's, that's fine. I don't like your purple face or whatever. In other words, you just you know, say, it's not real. So it doesn't, who cares what the person is saying? But if they hit us right where it hurts, or if we just don't like being criticized at all about anything, and so we instinctively recoil, there is some part of us that needs to be healed. As Swamiji said, one of the greatest antidotes is humor, trying to find some way to laugh about it. Swamiji said, if somebody is uh, thinking bad things about you, you might say, well, how nice of them to think of me at all. You know, find a way to just laugh at the whole thing. But be sincere. Don't just pretend that, uh, um, that you're not hurt if you are. Swamiji said that when the first temple at Ananda village fell down, um, fell down, burned down, burned down, he was feeling, did I just tell this story? I, 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 I mean, not today, I know that much, but I thought <laughs> I've told it recently. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, when the first temple burnt down, he was meeting that with positive affirmation. Doesn't matter, Divine Mother, we will start again. We, you know, he had two other buildings, the common dome where people ate and the kitchen, but this was the third structure. It burned down, someone had left a candle burning. No problem, we'll, you know, it's, it's fine. And so with this vigorous positive affirmation, he met that uh, disaster. Because it wasn't as if there was oodles of money just lying around to build extra temples if needed. And so he said in the evening when he, when he was meditating and he felt that there was a certain hurt in his heart. That, that what he had been saying positively was he didn't want it to be only on the level of affirmation. And there was another reality, which was the hurt, which was essentially, Divine Mother, why? I mean, you know the struggles it took to create that temple. Don't you want this community, this spiritual work? Of all things, why would you take the temple? I mean, why not, you know, take the, the place where we eat? We can always eat outside, but the temple, I mean, it was your temple after all. And then when he opened himself to that to say, why? He suddenly was flooded with bliss, such joy. And he said, Divine Mother, why didn't you take the other buildings too? <laughs> he said, if the loss of a building could result in this feeling of bliss, what does anything matter? And it turned out, of course, as has often happened in Ananda's history, that when something has been taken, then it's uh, by God, then more gets built up and better. Like when the community burnt down, one of the things that had happened was, in 1976, one of the things that happened was people had built to be as far apart from each other as possible. There was a rule, in fact, that no house could be within sight of another house because we are all yogi hermits. And people got lonely. He said, we kind of, you know, what I kind of like for Sana. It's going to be nice to have him at least nearby. And so they, people reset, having done that, Let's scrap that. Divine Mother said, okay, and sent the fire and burned everything down. As Swamiji said, they burned down 21 out of the 22 homes. And then that last building, Haridas related, a tree fell on a few months later. He said, because Divine Mother said, I said every house. <laughs> so this happens in our lives sometimes too. It's not always easy to laugh at then, but it's the same thing. It's just clearing the deck for new growth. So let us, especially though, when thinking which God to worship in addition to Krishna, in addition to the God of all gods, and in addition to Divine Mother, let us look to God in the form of the Guru. That's really what Arjuna was doing in talking with Krishna. He was also representing the Guru. And if you follow the Guru, you can't ever go wrong. God bless you.